just went to game three of Celtics Mavericks finals, which we're going to talk about in a second. But once upon a time, I had an occasional podcast partner who would come on <laughs> and we would talk basketball and I really looked forward to it and I had a great time and I thought we really had something special. And then one day I see the bottom ticker of ESPN and my podcast partner who had told me at dinner just a couple weeks before with Larry David as a witness, <laughs> how you didn't miss coaching. This was the most relaxed you'd ever been. You can't believe you had to take a year off. And then all of a sudden, in a couple of days, you were the Milwaukee Bucks head coach. And your explanation was, I have a chance to coach Giannis. That was really <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it was so funny because we did, we had uh, dinner, great dinner. Everybody was relaxed. I was very relaxed at the time. And then uh, the Bucks opportunity came up and I took it. It was just such a good opportunity. Uh, not only Giannis with Dame and Chris Middleton, a, a team that had won it already. Um, yeah, things changed quickly. Well, and the case I made, and we hadn't, we didn't really have a long conversation about it, but you know, I was hurt. I, I was trying to put the pieces together, but ultimately <laughs> you've been competing your whole life, right? Since I don't know when you started playing basketball, but then you played forever, then you coach forever. And it's just this switch. You, you just couldn't flick it off. You have to compete. You know, it's true, Bill, but I would say this. I was not going to just take any job that I told mm. you guys that that night. Um, if a coaching job had just opened that I didn't think it was the right organization or the right people, uh, the right guys to coach, uh, an opportunity to win or at least build winning, I was out. Uh, and if that job had never surfaced again, I was not going to take a job. I was literally sitting there. I was getting better at golf finally. Uh, you know, that's not what I so, heard, but fine. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll believe it on the pod. Yeah, we do have to talk about that because I heard right when I left, there's a guy named Larry David who made a comment that he's going to lose money now. Is that true? I think that is true. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think I, it I'm is gonna, true. I'm going to let him live with that. I'm gonna well, what was it like to comment. just what was it like to just walk into a season without a training camp and without a summer and without any knowledge of the team you're coaching and you're basically just coach for hire coming in trying to figure out your team the players all the coaches you have you're in a new city you're living in a hotel room like what were the, what were the first like three four weeks like it was hard uh bill way harder honestly uh than I thought you know I coached for over 20 years. I thought I can just jump right back into it um, and, and get things going. And that just wasn't the case. Uh, first of all, we were going to go on our toughest road trip of the season uh, yeah. right, out, right out of the gate. Um, I think the biggest thing that I would say for anyone who has done this is that you don't have your staff. And, and I found that to be very difficult uh, starting out. Um, and, and all the guys that I had were, were fine coaches. They were good. They just wasn't mine. They were, I wasn't used to like what you inherited. they did. Right. I inherited two staffs, Bud's old staff and then Adrian's new staff. Cause they, they kind of commingled. And, and so now I'm coming in as a third person, you know, that was difficult trying to figure out who I would use in different spots, defensively, offensively, all that was hard. Uh, and then we had all the injuries, but it did. It, it took a while, but I will say this: by the end of it, uh, I felt like, man, this is going to be a great job. Um, you know, obviously with Giannis out and and Dame injured and, and Chris playing at probably ninety percent with his health, uh, you knew you wasn't going to go far in the playoffs. I did feel like if somehow we could sneak this first round out without Giannis, uh, with Dame getting healthy but not healthy. Uh, if we can get to the second round and Giannis comes back, I yeah. thought we could we could make a run, uh, but that never happened. So the Giannis injury that I mean we've seen that injury a couple times where they're a little cagey about how long it's going to be. Oh. But if you if you just Google the injury, you're like, oh, that's a month and a half injury. So you know you know at least it's three four weeks, right? And of course that takes you through the first round, so you know you're going to the first round without Giannis, basically. Yeah, I knew. 
I know if anybody can come back, it would probably be him. But I never thought that he would make it back for the first round. I was hoping. Uh, there was there was whispers that maybe Game Seven. I don't think that would have happened. And, and truth be told, uh, because after the playoffs were over and and watching them work out, I don't think he would have made it back for the Knicks series uh, until probably Game Three or Four. Uh, but you know that's how playoffs are. You you have to have health. You have to have a lot of things to go for you go your way. And, and we just didn't have that. Does the KD what happened to him in 2019 hang over the heads of a situation like that? It has to, right? It really does. I was surprised by that um, because it wasn't an Achilles, but it looked like one. Uh, just like I was actually at the KD game. Yeah, it was Clippers. Uh, no, no. Oh, it no, was, it was uh, the Rockets. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It was the Rockets, and Austin was playing for the Rockets. Right. Uh, I think that was the first time or maybe the second time in my life that I got to see Austin play a live game that I wasn't coaching him. Uh, yeah. And I remember sitting in the stands and right when it happened, you know, as you did and everyone did, we thought, oh, wow, he just tore his Achilles. Yeah. You know, now with Giannis, I didn't know, but I can tell you, forget the KD flashback. For me, it was a KG flashback. Uh, uh, Utah. Because Utah, I, I remember sitting next to Eddie LaCert and KG was running down the floor all by himself, and he just stopped and went to the floor. And I remember Eddie LeCert turned to me and said, this is bad uh, because no one's around. Like, that's the bad injuries in our league. If, if you run into collision, injuries rarely happen. It's when you're running by yourself and your body decides, I've had it with something. And, and so, honestly, when that happened, that was the first thing that I thought about was Kevin Garnett. And somebody like Giannis, he seems so indestructible. You just assume it's like a LeBron thing. It's shocking when he even tweaks anything. You're like, Dude, how, are, how are you even hurt? You're superhuman. So when to watch him go down, you go, oh boy, this has to be bad to have him be hurt. No doubt, especially knowing that he doesn't like to sit in practice. He doesn't like to sit in games. Um, you know, fortunately, we were up by like 40 against your Celtics that night, if, <laughs> right. if, I, if, I, if I remember right. Uh, but even that game got close after Giannis went out. They made yeah. a run. So uh, it was an interesting night for sure. What was the most surprising thing just being with him day to day for two months that you weren't expecting? Obviously, you coached against him. You had a pretty good feel for him. But was there anything you learned from the day to day? He's a much better playmaker. Oh. than I thought. Uh, you know, the the energy and the athleticism, some of the things he does, Bill, you can watch him every day for the rest of your life, but some of the things he does, you'll shake your head at every night. You know, um, taking off from the elbow, one dribble from half court, making it to the basket. I mean, he, he does things that no one else can do. Um, but coming in and taking the job, I thought one of the things that I had to do was make him a better playmaker, see if he, see if he can be a facilitator. And I was surprised at his vision. Like, he really has good vision. Uh, and he, in a lot of ways, was our point guard at times for us. And I think that's one of the reasons we miss him so much against the Pacers. And then other than that, he's our, our best player. But um, his vision surprised me. Uh, it gave me more hope that when we get this right, uh, that we can really do some things offensively. It was funny talking to you on podcasts about Milwaukee before you took that job, when you didn't know you were going to take the job. Yeah. And talking about Giannis and Dame, how it's a little harder to mix those guys than maybe people think because ways people can sag off, you know, because Giannis isn't a great three-point shooter and just little, little tricks and just things you have to do. So then you take the job. And did you feel like you unlocked that at all by the end of the season or no? Yeah, I thought we got really good at, at a lot of little things with Dame and Giannis. Um, you know, I thought, first of all, they start connecting and their two-man game was becoming lethal. I think he was second or third best in the league. And it still, in my opinion, hasn't scratched. You know what was the most difficult thing? And it took me a little bit to figure it out. Um, Dame didn't have the ball in his hands a lot at times. And it was hard to, to visualize, like, why is this happening? Um, and, and the reason is, on misses, when Giannis gets the ball, he's elite. You want him to break out. Dame was going backwards half the time to go get the ball. Giannis is gone. Right. And, 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 and so 
then you're okay. So a message Dame doesn't get it unless it's thrown ahead to him or unless it comes to him in the action, but he has to be in front of the ball for that to happen. And then on makes, Giannis broke the ball up some, and then Chris brought the ball up some. And I started thinking, like, wait a minute. If that happens, we're cutting about 80% of the time that Dame is used to having the ball right. from Portland. And you, you just can't do that. And, and so what we came to by the end on makes, Dame brought the ball up the floor 90% of the time. On misses, we wanted Giannis to go. And so we're getting the best of both worlds. And that's to me, is where we're headed. We really never got a chance to to work on it. But I thought that was a huge breakthrough for us. And the, the damn situation where he gets traded, he leaves his family behind, he's going through a divorce and um, just seemed like a lot of personal stuff that was weighing him down. How did you, how did you navigate that during the season and try to get his spirits up? That's hard. Uh, that was really hard. Uh, two things. And, you know, it's funny because I was podcasting with you and golfing with Larry. I didn't even realize that Dane was traded two or three days before training camp. Right. Uh, and so Dane was telling me we were at dinner and he said, coach, I didn't work out all summer. It's the first time in my life that I've not worked out. I was so scared of getting injured working out. Oh, because he was a possible trade. Yeah. Yeah. He, he knew he was going to get traded. So he said, you know, I did some light running. I did some shooting uh, with no one in the gym, but I didn't go at all. He said, I was, I'm, I'm out of shape. And, and, and he was honest about it. That's one of the reasons you love him because he is honest. He said, this is the worst shape I've ever been in. And I, I, and you know, when you start camp that way, you don't ever get in shape. You never catch up. And he felt that way. It's, it's funny. <laughs> you know, I start calling him names like, like jokingly uh, with him, you know, talking about his weight and he's heavy and all summer now, you know, he, he's, I'm working twice a day. Uh, I'm down to this. Like, he is so proud that he's in great shape right now already, uh, which is amazing. It also tells you, you know, and I, I shared this with him last week. I said, it's amazing. You're doing two days right now, and the Celtics and the Mavs are still playing. Right. It, it just tells you how long of a journey it is for you to win a championship. There's Half the league is back to work for next season, and we still have two teams playing. Uh, it doesn't look like two teams will be playing much longer, but we, <laughs> right. have, we have two teams playing. Yeah, there was a photo the other day of KD and Chet and another guy all working out, getting ready. And it, it, is, like, it is crazy. It's so long. Plus, we had the Olympics this year. And, uh, you know, we'll see. But I'm sure you're watching the playoffs, and we haven't talked, at least on the podcast, in 2024. But you're watching the playoffs, and it's just so funky, right? Denver, Denver loses in round two. Um, you have the East just kind of loses its marbles. Butler gets hurt. The Knicks just fall apart one guy by one guy by one guy. You lose half your team. And Bede's hurt, and then he's healthy, but he doesn't still see him. And the East just completely falls apart. So on the one hand, everybody's like, well, Boston, they haven't beaten anybody. On the other hand, you know, the East blew up. But you're probably watching it going, holy shit, if we just gotten by round one, yeah, you know, you, you we think, match up you, with Boston the best in the conference. Well, we felt that uh, you still have to beat them, you know, Bill. They're they're awful good, and, and you got to give them their credit. They've been the best team in the NBA the entire season, and it's almost like no one wanted to believe it. You know, it's uh, everywhere the criticism of, of Jason Tatum and and of Brown and uh, who's the best player, and they're just. I, I tell you, uh, first of all, I don't think Joe gets enough credit. I've shared that with you before. I, I think he is such a detailed coach. I mean, in, in the game tonight, uh, he fouls up, you know, up six with 22 seconds. He was trying to foul. Right. And, you know, those are strategic things that are, are big. Uh, but watching how they play um, is just absolutely beautiful. How they play basketball right now. They share the ball. Everybody accepts their role. They know exactly where each other is at. I don't know how many more slot cuts they're going to get in this series where a guy drives, a guy drives from the slot or cuts from the slot. It's a layup. Uh, you drive, you find the corner guy. They, they're they making the right plays every night, and they're, they're over themselves. That's what I, I say this to you all the time. 
about it's so hard to win. It is so hard to win a title. And, and you know, but when you see it, you also, it's visual to me. It's like art for me. When you watch, you watch every single guy that is over themselves. There's no drama. There's no jealousies. Everybody is good with their role. Everybody is becoming star in their role. And when you watch Boston, you know, uh, Jalen uh, Brown's going to be the MVP, I guess, of the finals. Through the first three games, definitely. Yeah, but you can make a strong case for Holiday. After um, the second game, I would have said he was leading the way. Yeah, and he did stuff tonight, like defensively. I thought the play where he drove and got kicked for the three might have been the biggest play of the game. And he just does it over and over. White makes a big three. You know, when he came down to it and, and Dallas made that run, um, the two biggest shots was, um, I think, Holiday drove, kicked four three. White makes the second three. Back-to-back, bam, the game's put away again. Um, and it's what they do. They're just a solid well-coached team who, you know, Kevin Garnett made this comment years ago. Sometimes you're good enough to win, but you can't because you're not ready to win. And, and, and Boston, watching them play right now, they're ready to win. They're just playing that way. I want to dive into this because I went to the game tonight and I saw the same thing you did. So you're talking about when teams get over themselves, which I think is a great way to put it. There was a moment in this game. I was sitting on the behind the Celtics bench, like about 10 rows up. And they go on that run in the third quarter. And I've watched so much of this team over the last seven years. But the the one thing they have this year is they'll go on these runs and they know they know it's happening as it's happening, right? There's like a little swagger to them now that I just don't feel like they had in other years. So they go up 85-70 at the end of the third quarter. And then they hit to two threes at the start of the fourth quarter. They were up 91-70. And I was watching the bench and how locked in everybody is. And it really reminded me, I texted Steve Kerr. I was like, this reminds me of what was happening with you guys two years ago. It was somewhere between the fourth and the fifth game of the finals. And just the team, lot, the Warriors locked in. And you know these moments in the series where you're like, oh, they figured this out. I remember this happened with the 08 Celtics in the Pistons series somewhere between game five and game six, right? And somewhere in game six, it was like, this is over. They're winning this. What happens? How does, explain, because you coach teams that that's happened. What happens when the five guys lock in like that and the bench locks in and everybody's just like, holy shit, this is it. It's a combination of the whole season. And, and, and I, I, it's funny, I, I had this conversation with our team this year um, and our staff, like each round you get better. Uh, people who have never been on the journey have no idea how much you improve from round to round as a basketball team. And it's not that you're improving as a player. You're improving as a team. You start trusting each other more. You start getting less uh, insecure about stuff, uh, individual stuff. Um, you, you're, you're no longer concerned about the one thing, and that's giving yourself to the team. Uh, you buy into everything. And there's a happy place, Bill. I really believe this. There's a happy place that teams get to. And the only way they can get to it is by, you know, sometimes it happens in, in, the, in the Eastern or Western finals. You can see, oh, boy, they just hit the button. Yeah. And now, now you're going to have to beat them. You, you know what I mean? And, and Boston's been there. Um, but even in this series, you can see, like, a year ago, they lose the game tonight. I agree. They lose that game. I they, actually they, think they lose it twice. I think they lose in the first quarter when it's 19 yeah. and nine and the crowd's into it. I think they start doing hero ball threes and all of a sudden they're down 20. And then they lose it again in the fourth quarter as the lead's slipping away. Crowd's into it. They can't buy a basket anymore. Everyone's just jacking up 20 footers. And I think they, they definitely were lost it in 22. They definitely were lost it last year. And it's the difference. And it's it comes down at the end of the day to trust the two things that happens. The, your star players trust everyone on the team, including the coaches. And then the, the role players trust themselves and they trust the star players. And, and then when that all happens, you, you, it's almost impossible to beat that team. 
Um, and you you see it every year. Every year it happens. Uh, it happened to Denver last year. You totally. can go every, every year. Uh, it's funny. It was beautiful. Golden State, uh, their last title, because they had won it, but then they lost it. And then they had to go back on a journey, and they had to, to bring in some of these young guys. Jordan Poole played great for them. Um, right. And they had to – it was like – yeah, Wiggins. It was a retrust. And what's better to watch is, you know, Tatum is great to watch, and, and Brown's been great. But it's it's awesome to watch Derek Derek White. Um, I'm forgetting the backup center tonight. Um, for oh, the Tillman. Th- this, Tillman! This was a borderline Tillman game. Eleven minutes, good defense on Luca. Hit a big corner three. He was great. Um, you know, uh, Hauser made big shots in the first half. Three for three. Yeah, all trust though. That's all yeah. trust. And and the only reason Hauser can make that shot is the star players have to make a play and then they have to trust instead of forcing shots. And that's what they do. Watching the Celtics play in the first half compared to watching the Mavs play, uh, it was just two different. The Mavs, first time there in a long time, first time there with this team. And you can see the difference. It, it just takes, it takes everything to win. And the Celtics are doing it. Yeah, the Celtics had 26 assists tonight. Dallas had 15. And what they've done to Dallas the whole series is it's hero ball one-on-one stuff. Nobody else is involved. You know, Kyrie and Luke, I think, took 55 shots combined tonight. And then you felt it in the end. Luca fouls out. And we'll talk about the sixth foul in a second. But, um, and it becomes like, all right, this is going to be Kyrie show, win or lose. And as a Celtics fan who's been with this Tatum Brown era now for, you know, two-thirds of a decade, seven years, this game played a lot of the hits where they look great. Uh-oh, we're up 21. Now it's 15. Now it's 13. Up, oh, there's a lid on the basket. Like, this is the exact type of game they've either lost or almost lost 20 times this year. But then there's this Kyrie piece where Kyrie, he comes in as the big brother, right? Tatum's first year. Yeah. And then it doesn't work out the second year. And then, all right, the, the last level of the video game now to go up 3 nothing in the finals you got to beat this dude that you played with and was supposed to be there for, it was just weird. It was like surreal to watch, right? It's like, this is how it's going to end in game three. Yeah. But it, you know, it's still, you know, it's, it's funny because Dallas has gotten a lot of criticism because of their offense. Right. And, and what it's not their offense is what the Celtics are, are doing to their offense. You know? Yeah. So explain uh, that. Explain what they're doing. Cause I don't think people fully understand it. Yeah, but you have two superstars on boss on 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 the maps, and they know that they're going to garner help. They come into the game knowing that every team's going to send two guys. They're always going to send an extra guy when they get to the basket. The Celtics aren't doing that. They're staying home. So in in a lot of ways, the Celtics are getting away with guarding Luca for the most part and Kyrie all the time. Single coverage. And even when they beat them off the dribble, they're still not sending help. They're saying, uh, beat us over the top, make shots over the top. We're going to get out to all your players. And, and so, you know, it and, looks and spend, bad. And by the way, spend energy doing that. Yeah, spend Because Luke and Kyrie were dead in the third quarter, and then they rallied a little bit. But it, it was they were, when you're carrying an offense like that and just over oh. and over again banging bodies, yeah. like that's, and, you know, Luca's not in the greatest shape either. Yeah, no, no, he definitely <laughs> is not. And, and, and so, like, those shots that Washington was getting against Minnesota, they were wide open. Now right. there's someone there. And you can see, I don't know how many times, I thought there was a play late that they threw it to Washington into the corner, and he should have shot it right away. And he drove but, to the paint, and yeah. And he drove it and it had nothing. And, and the reason he didn't shoot it is because people have been there all night. And so, you know, he's, you know, we always used to laugh. He's seeing people that aren't there. And on that one, no one right. was there. He should have shot the ball. But that's what happens. And uh, give Boston credit. Their defensive game plan has been fantastic. And let's be honest, they have the ability to do it. They have so many good defenders. Uh, to me, as good as Brown has been offensively, he's been unbelievable defensively. And and not only on Luca, but more on Kyrie because yeah. of his size and his physicality. He's been amazing. Yeah, I voted for Brown for All NBA, and part of the case was the two way game. 
and how hard he plays night to night. Because I, I think, especially in where the league is in 2024, and this is one of the things I love about Giannis, who, as you know, is a competitive sociopath, who he just literally is incapable of not trying 100%. Brown was like that this year. I thought Brown set the tone. One of the reasons they won as many games as they did, I mean, they're 79 and 20 right now, which is, you know how hard that is. That's a crazy record. And one of the reasons is because that guy, he went up a level and, you know, we've seen this, really the money started to come in in the late 80s when you were in the league and the, spe- the 90s was when it really came in and we saw guys go a bunch of different directions, right? Yeah. You, you played against how many talented dudes in the 90s that once they got a contract, it went sideways or something happened or they got hurt. It's, it's, and it, Yeah, it's either a contract or... Um, you know, uh, this 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 is a different generation where everyone has their own like image, and you know it's harder to get everyone to buy in. Uh, there's they're so worried about their brand, and right. and the guys and the guys that do win, and they realize their brand is even better. But um, Brown gets three hundred and four million, and everybody's like, "Oh my God, that's so much money." He's the, he's the most overpaid guy in the league. He got better. And I've been saying this on the pod all year. He's been better all year. He was the biggest guy in the game tonight on both ends. He made the biggest shot of his career with a minute left when they're they're up two. They need a basket. Dallas is looming. You could feel the Kyrie three coming. And he hits this 18-footer. It's just money that won the game. But I think the mental toughness, the mental toughness with him compared to two years ago, it's night and day. It's night and day and going left. Right. He made that shot. Yeah. Um, you watch him. He this summer he worked on his game. You know, everyone said he couldn't go left. He couldn't do these. He's done them. I think the biggest difference watching Brown play for me is Brown has fluctuated energy wise. I, I think or, or or focus wise. I think I think he's matured. I mm. think he's, he's 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 turned into, you know, as we say, a grown ass man. And, and, and he comes into every game with that that mindset, uh, and I think a lot of it is is work on the court, but a lot of it is is who he is mentally and where he's at, and, and that he's grown up, and, and well, you can see it. Remember when this happened to Paul, when that year the Indiana loss, when he took his, when he wore the uh, thing on his head, you he, he were so bad, and yeah. all of a sudden he's in trade rumors, but then he came back that next year. And he was awesome. And the team sucked. But he was awesome. And that was the first year he put together a really professional start to finish, awesome two-way veteran leader year. And then that led to 08 when, you know, he did it the whole year with KG and Ray and everybody. Bill, to this day, I tell people the reason we won it in 08 is because of Ball's second year with me. Uh, you remember we, we butt heads a lot. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, we had uh, Paul, I just heard him telling this on some podcast. We had this big falling out of my office um, and uh, he, he he was pissed because I asked him a question that he thought was, why would you ask me this question? I asked him, could he shoot? I said, are you a good shooter? And, you know, Paul, if you know, Paul, Paul, Paul has confidence. And, and I remember him saying, what kind of question is that? I said, no, I'm serious. Do you think you're a good shooter? And he says, I'm a great shooter. You know, what are you talking about? I said, well, you're shooting 40%. I said, so Paul, either you're a shitty shooter or you're taking crappy shots. Right, you're a great shooter who takes shit shots. Yeah, I said, it's got to be one of the two. You just told me you're a great shooter, but you're shooting 40%. And he was like yelling, like, what are you trying to tell me? I said, I'm trying to tell you, you take bad shots. And, And if you want to be a winner, you have to move the ball. We'll get the ball back to you, and the defense is now shifted, and you'll score easy. And I and I've told this a hundred times. He came back in my office after butting heads the whole year, and said, "We're good." Now I didn't know what that meant. I I, th- I thought I knew. I thought he was going to try it the way that I wanted to, and he did it. And that following year, I mean, if you go look at his percentages, they skyrocketed. Uh, the problem is we sucked. <laughs> you know, our, our right. He should have been an all NBA guy that year and the team was yeah, too really bad. Should have been. Yeah. He uh, was great. It made it easy though. So when Kevin and Ray joined, it was easy for him. He had already done that. Right. He'd already kind of given himself. Yeah. So it's the same thing. He, he grew up. 
Well, the, the and the reason I wanted to talk about Paul versus Jalen was Paul in that playoffs goes head to head with LeBron. It's a younger version of LeBron, but it was still LeBron. Yeah. He was in the league for five years, beats him in a game seven, outplays him. And then in the finals, let's be honest, he kind of outplayed Kobe. Like he, like for real, it's, it was, he at least played him to a draw. But the thing that was cool about it was he really thought he was as good as Kobe. Whether that's true or not, we could bait it. I, I, I think we know the answer. But he thought he was as good. And that's what, I, that's what I'm seeing with Jalen in this finals. Luke is better than him. But Jalen doesn't think that. Jalen really thinks it's like me and Tatum are on this dude's level and he's carrying himself that way. Yeah, but the, the thing that has made Jalen great is the two things. Number one, he thinks he's better than everybody. Right. And, and, uh, but he also knows he's on a team with another great player and, and it's not a competition. Yeah. It's not a competition for them. I think it used to be, uh, but it isn't anymore. And again, I keep going back to the maturity thing. And, and, and they're competitive. And that's the point I meant with, with Jalen, just watching how competitive he is now. He doesn't back down to anyone. Um, and I do think Ed and White, uh, I think Horford, uh, I think Drew, they all help him. They all help yeah. each other. Um, but man, they are a connected basketball team. And if you're going to win, you have to be connected. Does Jalen remind you of Paul? He does. Um, you know, same size, can get a shot wherever he wants. You know, can guard not, different types of players, can guard smaller yeah. players, bigger players. He's kind of stronger than you think. Better defender than Paul. And Paul was probably a better offensive player uh, in some right. ways where, where Paul was special. And all the great ones, the Kobe's, at the end of the game, they could tell you, they could tell their opponent where they're going to get the shot at and where they're going to shoot it from. Uh, Paul, of anybody I coach, knew his spots. Yeah. And, and he felt like if he can get to it, there was nothing defensively you were going to do to stop him unless he just missed the shot. Uh, and that's what made Paul so good. Well, you know, it's funny. Then you coach the ultimate example of all time of that. Chris Paul, who shot the same jumper from the same shot two inches over from the right side of the foul line over and over again, and nobody ever realized he was shooting it from there. Going like right. a thousand times. Going, Going right. right. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's funny. Um, as a coach, I, I do remember as a player, Mike Fratello, you know, <laughs> against the Milwaukee Bucks, John Lucas went left, 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 left. Beat me left three times. And, you know, he calls a timeout. And he's like screaming at me. He basically said, you have another game like this, you'll be out of the league. <laughs> he's right. like, yeah, yelling at me. And I'm thinking in my mind, I swear to God, I'm trying to keep him from going left. He, he's good at it, you know. And, and by the end of my career, and I was never on that level of these great players, but I remember a young player walking up to me before the game and said, hey, Doc, you're not going right tonight. And I told him, well, I'm not going left. So <laughs> right. <laughs> something's gonna happen. But you great players, they're gonna get to their spot. They just are. They're just that good at it. Well, and, one of the you things you can see it every night. Yeah, one of the things that was amazing this whole series, but especially tonight, because Kyrie, he sucked in the first two games and, and it was a lot of hero ball stuff and he didn't get his teammates involved. That's about as bad as I think the crowd got to him, there's no question. The game tonight, you could see he had a hop and a step. He was making threes. And at some point, especially in the second half, Holiday was like, all right, I got, I got him. Yes. And they started whatever Holiday was doing and then Kyrie responded to it. It was like watching those boxing matches where it's like the, the lightweights or like the, you know, that, that, like those 125 pounders yeah. or one, where they're just, they're moving at a speed where you can't even keep track and it just seemed faster than everyone else in the court. But, it was great to watch. And the reality is it was a great moment for Kyrie and, and they made him take hero ball shots and he couldn't, he couldn't make the plays. Yeah. And I, you know, it's funny. I don't know if Kyrie sucked in the first two games or their defense made him struggle. Yeah. Or maybe you both. Know, yeah. And I think it's a little bit of both. I thought the biggest change tonight is you're right. I thought holiday instead of picking them up at half court, because I thought Dallas did something really good tonight. They took the ball out and they got the ball up the floor quick. And so Boston never got into their full court pressure. Right. But then if you go watch the last six minutes, think about it. One of the biggest fouls of the game 
was they try to set a pick on Holiday at half court because he was up pressuring the ball again, and that's what affects them. Uh, and I thought he started doing it late. And, you know, think about if you're Kyrie. Luca's out of the game. I got Holiday picking me up full court. Right. And once I get it across, then I have to make the play. And I have uh, no other offensive creator on the floor with me. No one else that can create a shot for him. So, yeah, he was, he was, he was against a lot the last five minutes. You took over that Bucks job and they had traded Drew, what, six months before? Was there still a shadow with Drew at all when you took the team over? Because, oh, I mean, yeah, he was one yeah. of the most beloved Bucks of all time. Yeah, it was funny. It was more not that they, they wanted him back. They loved Dame and all that. But he was their leader. You know, he, was, he led by example and, and by what he did. Um, and you don't just replace that. That takes a little bit of time. And, and, and think also, again, they did this trade late. Yeah. You know, so it, it had everybody probably in a shock a little bit. But you heard his name. Like, it's, it's funny. I've always been a big holiday. I've always liked him a lot. I thought he, he really took care of Austin his, fresh, his rookie year in New Orleans. You know, mm -hmm. he was Austin's rook. And, and Austin always, you know, I remember Austin being the first person we were talking about players, and I remember Austin's rookie year, after his rookie year, was sitting there having dinner. He said, you know what the most underrated player in the NBA is? And I said, who? And he said, Drew Holiday. I said, what? What are you talking about? He said, that this guy defensively, there's nobody in the league that can do the things that he can do. Well, then when you get to Milwaukee and you coach and you hear, you just hear stories about him, not on the floor, just as a person. Mm. And, and you think, man, now you got to put this guy on another level. Uh, you like him even more. They just don't make a lot of people like that. And, and you know, like he, he's, a, he's like a champion. Um, and, and, and so it's really cool. You know, it looks like he's going to get another one. And it's because of not just his play, but who he is. Yeah, there's a confidence with him. Yes. That when you've won when you've won on the biggest stage and he had one of the great sequences probably in the history of the finals when he's strip booker and then throws the, that crazy alley up to Giannis, to Giannis. You, you have a play like that. It's yeah. like, you're, you're kind of minted after that, but you could feel it in the first two Boston games. Cause there was a couple moments Tatum wasn't playing well in game one. That game was never really in doubt, but in game two, there's a couple moments when, you know, previous Celtics teams, I think, I don't know if they would have folded, but they could have had a little patch where all of a sudden they're down eight. And he was, I thought, the alpha on the court, which I, 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 I hadn't gone to a playoff game yet until this series with them. But I was surprised by that because he's everyone says he's a quiet guy, quiet leader, but there's an intensity to him that you can kind of feel, right? He, he reminds you of Maurice Cheeks in that oh, way. yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean, Maurice Cheeks would score eight points in the game and they would be the most meaningful eight points. Yeah. A team makes a run, and he would push it up and take that quick pull-up jump shot. And then he'd go back to doing his other stuff, and then, they need, and then he'd do it again. Drew does it more. You know, he, he's that plus a better score. He does it more, and, and that's what makes him so good. You know, it's, it's amazing watching all the little things that he does, their team does. You know, they're fun to watch. I hate to say it because – you know, I'm the coach of the Milwaukee They're in your Bucks. conference, right. Yeah, but they are a fun team to watch. All right, so Boston's up 91-70. And everyone on Dallas is disconnected. The body language is awful. Nobody's talking. As you know, I'm the body language. I'm one of the premier body language experts of all time. Celtics body language, A+. Plus. Dallas body language, Lucas standing in the corner. Kyrie's over there. And I'm like, oh, man, we broke them. We, we broke them. This happened. Then a couple missed shots. Dallas makes a couple. All of a sudden, it's coming back. Luca picks up, I think, a fourth foul at some point. He, stupid foul on Pritchard. Just like a hand check foul. It's like the kind of foul when you're the best player on the team and then the game you can't have. Then he gets a fifth foul. And then all of a sudden, sixth foul. When they're really coming back, it's 93-90, 4-12 left. Jalen drives it to him. They call the foul. Now, kid has to challenge, right? You have to, but he's moving. They can't reverse it. Were you shocked by that call? This is the best guy in the game. 
I didn't like the call uh, in general because I didn't, you know, I just didn't like the call. But if you're going to blow the whistle on that, it was the right call. Right. It absolutely was a foul. You know, it's funny. You know, I, I was watching the game over Larry's house. Yeah. And Luca picks up his fourth foul. And Larry will tell you, I turned to him and said, Luca's going to foul out in this game. He's not going to make it through this game. He's really emotional. Um, there was really? a play so you right... just, you, you read it. You just didn't like, there was something you noticed and didn't like. Yeah. I told Larry sitting right there. I said, Luke is going to fall out in this game. I said, he's really emotional. There was a play and he got fouled on that drive, you know, toward the basket. And I think it was Tatum forearms him, falls out of bounds. Luke right. had lost it. That was a clear foul. That, that to me, that call literally has to be made. Uh, they didn't make it. They just, you know, they didn't make the call. And and, and so from that point on, Luca, those fouls came right after that. He he yeah. just it he snapped, you know, in, in some ways. And you know, I wouldn't say he snapped, but he just I know what you mean. He j- he just got lathered up. Yeah, he got he started lathered playing up. He started playing angry. He started playing angry, he started playing physical, and he start he does this thing sometimes, and all the great players do it. They start daring the ref. Yeah. Uh, well, you didn't call that. Make this call. And so they said, okay, we'll blow the whistle. We will. And listen, you you have Cape as a ref and, and Mark. Did. Those aren't the guys you want to mess with. Right. You know, and, I, and Larry was laughing because I told him, I said, Luca's messing with the wrong group tonight. Right. <laughs> this, this is not going to go well for him. And, 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 and it didn't. You know, so it was, we were laughing because Larry was laughing and said, you just said that. And I said, you can see it happening. You can literally see it happening. Well, they, I mean, they were letting everything go. It was a super physical game. And I thought one of the reasons Dallas came back was because kids, you know, he's one of the best 50 players ever. He's been in games like that. And I think he told his team, like, ramp it up, man. They're not calling anything because their defense got so physical in the fourth quarter, but it was working. I mean, it was one of the reasons Boston's offense, I know people, they see it and they're like, oh, Boston's choking. Dallas was, hey, this game turned into a rugby match and Dallas kind of realized it before Boston did. And that was one of the reasons they came back, I thought. That was a reason and Boston did something that you do. That's another reason it's so hard. They thought about winning a title for about five or six minutes. Yeah, they, they started thinking yeah, about, yeah. oh my God, we could close this on Friday. Yeah, they you could feel it. They start slowing the ball down. Uh, they were they were milking the clock. You can see it. Um, and they had a momentary lapse uh, of thinking about uh, what's ahead instead of staying locked in. And then all of a sudden they got locked back in and they win the game. I think it'll allow them to close out now because they've already had their their scare. You know, Dallas is going to have to play unbelievable to win this next game, or it's going to be a sweep. And the, the thing we're not talking about with Boston, they've not lost a road game in the playoffs. This is an historic run. If they, if they win uh, the next game, they've only lost two games in the entire playoffs, and they went undefeated on the road. They're That's 34, they're th- I think 34 and 14 on the road. Just period this season. Yeah, this was a, and I told you this, so you know I'm I'm not lying. Everyone, you know, everyone asked me before every game, what's going to happen? What do you think? And once KP got scratched, which we haven't even talked about, and I think people just assumed Dallas came three, they're home, they're going to win. And I, I was like, I was telling everybody, I think the Celtics are going to win tonight because they haven't made threes yet, and for whatever reason, I can't explain it, but they play better on the road. And I don't really fully understand it, especially Tatum. I think he plays, I think home. And I've asked people with the Celtics about this, like, why is Tatum better on the road than home? What are the reasons? And there's a bunch of it, right? When you're home, you're dealing with tickets for everybody. You, you know, you're, you you're are, with your but, family. But, yeah, you're like, you're, you I'm preaching better. the choir with you, though. Yeah, but usually you play better at home. Um, the only place that I thought it was difficult to play at home was in Philly because of the crowd, and it, I thought it affected our players some. But that's the, uh, I think this is the Tatum piece, though. I think yeah, people yeah. have been watching him for so long. When it's not going well for him, you can hear this weird murmur in the crowd. Yeah. And it's just that energy is a little weird. And once that happens, it's hard to get it out of your brain when you're a player. 
Uh, but they are awful good on the road. It's amazing how comfortable they are. And the other thing, their role players play well on the road, which, right. you know, you know, well, and they and hit threes that. on the road. They were 17 for 46. Yeah. And that was one of the things I was telling people. I was like, watch our threes for over 15. That's that's where they need to be. And I, by the way, I think they're going to be over 15. I think they're finally going to hit some of these. So, you know, they just played free and loose. Jalen Brown used a, uh, a term that I've never heard. I loved it. He, he, he talked to the, about their bench and they're, they call them stay ready players. And I've never heard that before. And I was like, oh, I love that. I'm using that. I'm stealing that. The that, stay that, readies? That's, yeah, he said the stay readies were, were all great tonight. Uh, and that says a lot about that, that that team has had a lot of talk to each other about, hey, one might you may play 15 minutes. One day you may play none. You just have to stay ready. And they've all bought into it. And you can feel it. That's another thing we talk about. Made teams, connected teams. They be, they've become that. Well, and that's the thing when K, so KP, that injury that I don't, I can't even explain what it was. <laughs> like this, it's part of the body nobody ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. And they're saying like the 30 people in America have had this injury this year. It's like, okay. Um, but then he gets scratched. Have you been in a situation like that where one of your best players is like, all right, he's out. He's, he's 50, 50, my play, my play. No, he's actually not playing. But with this team, I was like, I don't know. I think they might be okay. That well, I think so deep. they're so yeah. deep. I mean, they, they really are. Uh, your replacement is Horford. <laughs> I mean, and some Pritchard on. minutes and a little yeah, Tillman. Yeah. And Tillman they're was so awesome deep. tonight. Tillman was unbelievable. And and this is where, from a coaching standpoint, you're so happy for any guy that has gone through the journeys that the Tillmans have gone through. You know, uh, when when the Bucks won it, you know, obviously everybody was happy for Giannis. And, 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 but you're really happy for the, the Brooke Lopez is the Pat Connaughton's of the world. Yeah. Same thing. That's what a coach looks at is all the other guys that have to put in the same amount of work and sometimes even more work than the great player. And, and, and they get their shine and it's, it's really cool to watch. One of your closest friends on the planet is Sam Cassell. Yeah. Who you've sat next to a lot, who was on the OA team. He was at the tail end of his career, but got a ring, but then you went through a lot of wars with him and he's on this Celtics bench. What is it? What does he tell you about the team that you could talk about on a podcast without portraying him? The closeness. Uh, he, he says a couple of things that um, Dro, Joe holds everybody accountable and everybody allows him to uh, hold him accountable. You know, he, he said something uh, last week. He said, I remember you telling me he was talking to me and he said um, that players have to allow their coach to coach him. Uh, they have to they have to get to a place where, you know what, I'm just going to drop my guard down and I'm going to allow him to, I, I use the word, get in there and just just let him do his thing. Um, and then the coach, on the other hand, has to allow the player to, to do his thing through the team and that's where they're at. And, and he says, it's really amazing. Like, um, he said, Joe holds them accountable. Um, you know, all the time, and they're allowing him to do that. Um, and then the second part is, he said, he says, oh, he said, Doc, these boys are connected. There's, there's no, <clears throat> the word I always use, and he uses it now. There's no clutter. There's no clutter on this thing. There's just none. There's no clutter. Uh, there's, there's nothing can shake this team. Uh, and he talks about that all the time. When you see the media shit that goes on and look, I do three podcasts a week. Sometimes there's narratives you want to talk about, yeah. uh, but I, I've never, the Tatum Brown thing. I'm just, I'm all in on those guys. I've never, never really wavered. Like this is, there's something special with these two. But then when we get to the playoffs, there's something to talk about. Then it's like, who's better Tatum or Brown? Is Tatum good enough? Is Tatum elite? <laughs> Tatum's he's a first team all NBA guy, but is he really that good? And, how do you navigate that stuff as the coach? Because you know the guys see it. They're in a hotel room. They're on Twitter. They're getting texts from people. Um, how do you keep their heads from not kind of drifting toward this dumb shit? Well, as a coach, you call it the peripheral opponent. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, the, uh, Pat Riley used to use that term all the time, the peripheral opponent. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's more if your team is connected and if your team has a goal, that is bigger than the individual, it doesn't affect 
the team. It, it really doesn't. Um, yeah, I'm sure they all see it and they all hear it. And the family members, Bill, oh, can you believe they're, I mean, they, they you're sitting at dinner and I can tell you how it works. You're sitting at dinner sometimes with your family and your brother may be sitting there. Hey, Jason, can you believe they're saying Jalen is better? And Jalen is, I guarantee you, Jason hears it. And it's, it's white noise now. Like, but a year ago, two years ago, they may have gotten a discussion out of it's them. It's blue noise. Yeah. 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 It's so oh, whatever, you know, well, and, and, well, and you that's had this, what happens. Well, you had this in 2008. Paul won the finals MVP. You could have made a really good case for Ray. Could like a, a really good case. case. Yeah. I actually yeah. probably would have voted for Ray. Yeah. It was, it was even either way. Right. And I'm sure Ray didn't care because he was so excited to win the title, but that's something in this no, current the, that yeah that stuff happens in this current league i think it's, it's even more so you know Jalen wins the mvp of the eastern finals there was pure joy from everybody right there was, and it becomes an were, espn segment anyway where they're like wait yeah. was, was tatum really happy and it's like wait what yeah. he's happily smiling and clapping and you know what we all miss like who's every team's best defender on jason tatum every night um, and so we always miss that uh, sometimes, like the reason the, the other guys can get off because sometimes they don't have the best defender. Now, in Brown's case, it doesn't matter who guards him either. They're just two great players that plays on the same team that are over themselves and are more concerned about winning than they are about the individual stuff. And that's why they're winning. Yeah, I did something to top my podcast uh, a couple of days ago about a, just the culture of basketball. It's like, well, somebody has to be the best player and that's what happens because when Michael Jordan was in the Bulls, he was the best player and Pippen was second and that's just how we think about basketball. It's and only yet, happened once that you can make a case that the Detroit Pistons with Larry Brown that you couldn't circle who clearly was their best player. Yeah, well, you'd have to go way back because like the 79 Sonics were like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even the 89 Pistons, Isaiah was their best player, even though they had a yeah, bunch of yeah. stuff. But, yeah, but the Isaiah 08 was Celtics, clearly. KG yeah. was the best player. You could have made a case for other guys, but KG was the best yeah. player. No doubt. And and so, but you need the best. You need separators. Like, you yeah. want your best player. You want everybody to know. You know, uh, Perk always laugh. I, I, I swear I don't remember doing this, but it was in Milwaukee. Um uh, we had won a game, and I must have felt like Rondo, Perk, Baby, all those guys start thinking that they were part of the big three. Okay. I, <laughs> it's extended big three. Yeah. And I, I walked in the locker room after a win. I said, I want to make something clear tonight. We have a big three. We don't have a big four. We don't have a big five. Yeah. We don't have a big six. We have a big three. And this is who we play through every single time down the floor. And these big three guys will get everybody else shots. But don't get this twisted. We have a big three. <laughs> like Perk says that all the time. I swear I don't actually remember doing that. But he, him and <laughs> right. Rondo, uh, who I was at Rondo's wedding, by the way, this past weekend, which was amazing. Oh, wow. it, was where, it was where the James Harden toss, the bouquet toss. Oh, that was that video? <laughs> that oh, was my that. God. <laughs> That was at Rondo's wedding. So, well, you think about it. Sixteen years ago, since that team won, and does it matter who you think was the best player of the two thousand eight Celtics? Not really. That, Do you think anybody like gives point. a shit? And that's the thing. Like, let's say the Celtics win Friday night, Jalen Brown wins the MVP, and then two days later, it'd be like Jason Tate. Basically, what happened with Steph nine yes. years ago, right when Iguodala yeah. won the Finals MVP? It's like, well, what does this mean for Steph and his legacy? It's like, Nothing I guarantee he doesn't care. He just won the title. Even though I thought Steph should have won the MVP that year. Right. <laughs> I will yeah, say that. that. But it didn't matter. Like, you know who it didn't matter to the most? was Steph. He can care right. less. He's a champion. That's all that matters. Right. And then we had the same thing when he was in the 17 and 18 Warriors, when KD was there. And it's like, you know, he's, he's really happy to win back-to-back -back titles. I promise yeah. he's not, not sitting in bed at night going, Oh man, I can't believe I lost the finals MVP. Yeah. For my legacy, I need an MVP. No, he doesn't. <laughs> and, and he could have won that year too. Like, it's not like he wasn't great in those series. Yeah. He was. So yeah, I, I think that's the stuff that 
is talked about more outside of teams than it actually is worried about inside of teams. And yeah. if it is a worry, then that team's not going to win. If it is a worry with that team, that's not the team. They're not connected and they're, they're not going to win anyway. Do you see a scenario where Tatum and Brown are just together the whole time, like Bird and McHale were? Yes, I do. Uh, I think I, I do I, too. I think because of the salary structures now, uh, that they're going to both, you know, Tatum's about to get paid a lot of money. 315. Right? And, and so once they sign those deals, they're basically on that team. Now, the only difference is they're both young. So they have another, both of them have another big contract coming yeah. after this one. And that will be the only time that, that they would be considered possibly you, you separate them. But they could live an entire career together. Um, which when you can do that for any team, it's it's pretty special. Well, what that's the most special thing that like that's what is at stake for Clay this summer, right? Because I'm sure Philly, Orlando, somebody's gonna have a ton of money to offer him. Yeah. But you gotta start weighing like that's a hard that, one. You know, it's that's like a hard Jordan one. Pippen. Pippen ended up leaving because Jordan retired, but they played yeah. Jordan's entire or most of his entire career and pretty special yeah. bird and McHale, same thing. But yeah, it's it's a different level when you stick together that long. I mean, you had it with Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. Oh, wait, no, I guess I guess that's a bad example. No, that wasn't a good <laughs> example. That didn't last long at all. No. They, <laughs> but that, but that's, that's what you think about that. That's one of the reasons it is special when it happens. Like, think about all these twosomes, threesomes. Oh, my God, this has so much potential. And then it just blows up. All of a sudden, Ben Simmons is in London as your season's going on. You're like, what happened? We had this yeah. special thing. Where'd it go? It, Bill, it can go so quick. You know, um, you, you think I think about all the years that I've coached. And, and, and again, I, I'll go back to all the teams that I've coached. And, and, and the, there's times where I think I'm, I have my team overachieving at times. I thought the Philly team, you know, yeah. the year before they got swept in the first round by Boston. And now we've just won the regular season conference, you know, right. with the same team. Uh, but it, it doesn't take much. And that's what's so cool when teams win. You know, Vince starts struggling with free throws. And it became a thing. Uh, the next thing you know, he's gone. You know, um, I look at the, the the Chris Paul game where in Oklahoma City. You uh, remember? We're yeah, about yeah. to win. We're going to yeah. win that series. We're up. And Chris is the smartest player in NBA, one of the top, smartest players in NBA history. And he had literally two minutes of mistake basketball. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we didn't, we didn't foul. We, 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 uh, Chris tried to throw the ball from half court to draw a foul, which, you know, those are Chris Paul plays. And, and then we lose that game. We, we lose the next game and we're out. And, and the team never returned back the same after that. Well, you know? you, and then you had the Josh Smith, Corey Brewer game the next year. The next year, like, um, you know, from a coaching standpoint, we're up. And all of a sudden, and, and Chris was playing on one leg. That's the one thing I always tell people. We didn't have home court. Yeah. Uh, and Cr Chris was playing on one leg. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the guys you want taking shots start. Think about that game. Kevin McHale had benched James Harden. Harden. Yeah. Uh, and he was about to bench, take Dwight Howard out. Uh, <laughs> All of a sudden, they win the game. You know, it's uh, it's amazing. I went to that game. Harden had a towel on his head, and he was checked out for the season. And he was I think out. I think he might have been on Expedia making Vegas flights. And then all of a sudden, Josh Smith made a couple threes. But that, that, I mean, that Brewer. basically almost happened tonight. Yeah, it was ninety one seventy. You know, I think with the three point era, I never feel safe because I was getting congratulation texts, and I, I get so mad when people congratulate me, especially with the Celtics team. Like, well, don't, don't ever congratulate them. me during a Celtics game. Like, I, don't re, don't <laughs> I'm never them, safe. Bill. Yeah, no, <laughs> I just get mad. I just pretend I don't get them. Um, all right. This was fun. I had a good time. Um, you, what happens Friday? Any guesses? Or do you not want to make a guess? What do you, what do you, guess. What do you expect from a big picture standpoint? Like, down 3 nothing. Does Dallas shake it up? Do they just... Play the no, hits. They don't and... shake it up. I think they have to play the way they play. This is what got them there. Um, I think Luca and and Curry have to be incredible in this game for them to win. 
but I would not be surprised at all if Boston won four straight. Did you buy any, like it's game three and kid plays 11 guys in the first half. When you're at this stage of the playoffs in round four, you really know who your eight or your nine is at this point. That told me that he wasn't positive who he could trust beyond his first couple, right? Yeah, you're searching. And, and that that happens. Uh, you, you get down to, you know, um, Hardaway hadn't played a lot. So you, you, you kind of knew coming in he was going to play a little bit more. Um, you know, they needed their role players to play better. But it's, and I keep saying this, it's difficult because Boston's not helping. And so their role players aren't getting the shots that they're used to getting. And I think it's very difficult for them to play well. Yeah, this game four is weird because you think, oh yeah, they, they're going to sweep. But we've seen situations, like in 2017, Golden State goes up 3 nothing with one of the four best basketball teams probably of all time. And then they blow game four in Cleveland and they have to go back to Golden State and close. So you, you just never know. Wait, last yeah. thing. Uh, Jerry West. Yeah, that's sad. You know, uh, I knew that he was struggling. Uh, I saw his wife, Karen, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, I was able to text with him uh, a, a couple of times, but um, it really sad. Uh, but, you know, it's sad because we lost Jerry West. But then when you just sit back and think about this guy lived a life, you know, uh, I remember I, had, I was at a, a funeral years ago and a guy was sung about the dash, you know, whatever, 20, you know, 1904 to 2000 is where he lived and the dash in between. He filled his dash up, you know. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Yeah, he filled the dash up completely, you know, through his life. Um, and, you know, Jerry was a complicated person because he lived a very dark life, you know, growing up. And and to beat those odds from West Virginia, uh, to become the logo, uh, to be as almost as good of a front office guy as you are as a player when you're one of the greatest players ever. I mean, the dude overachieved everything. And, and of all the people that, you know, maybe of anyone I've met, his love and competitiveness for the game was unmatched. If you talk to Jerry, Last week, if you could, and you start bringing up the Celtic series, he would start crying. He would start having literally tears in his eyes. Think about how long ago that was, and it still affects him that they couldn't break through. Um, that just tells you the passion and the love that he had for the game that, that he was so great at. Yeah, I loved researching him and when I was doing my book. And I, he somehow, he's one of the, 12 best players of all time still, but it's somehow underrated because yeah. he was so great year after year after year and had just the worst luck on the planet. Like it's, he wins one title, but really could have won five. Um, you just could go through and it's like, well, if that didn't happen, if Elgin doesn't get hurt, Frank Selby shot goes, you just, you start banging all those out. But what was really interesting was how the other players revered him. And, you know, in the 69 finals, Havlicek goes up to him right after they win and just hugs him. And he's like, I love you. You, I really want you to win a title someday. I feel bad that we won. Like, that's how for a player to reach that kind of level with the other players that they're trying to beat, where they're like, I feel bad we're beating you. I, I've never heard of that. There's very few people like that. Um, and I think the reason was because of the way he approached the game. Yeah. Um, you know, he played the game as pure as you can play it and as hard as you can play it. Uh, and he had, you know, we always talk requirements. He had the required amount of intensity every single night. And, and it's what, what separated him. Yeah. I thought even watching the tapes and studying it, I, I, he's one of the guys from that era that you actually could have put into any era. And I, I think he's probably just as effective. He just would have figured it out. It's like, Oh, we have the three point line now. I'll become one of the best three point line. Like, he switched positions. You know how hard this is. He's basically the point guard of the Lakers the last four or five years. He was he a shooting really guard. Was. It was but a shooting he was guard. bringing the ball up. He led the league at assists. You know, he, whatever it took, he did. You know who could have been a great player in this era? Kevin who? Garnett. Because Garnett oh. would have been a, he would have been a great three point shooter. Uh, we, you know, no one just took him. But I always think, man, he was almost made for this era. 
And then the last thing right. I'm going to say about Iris before we get too lost is every old player loves that the game over the second half of the year became physical and scoring dropped. It, right. just, it answers every question. You know, all the arguments, well, the game was more physical. And then you have these guys saying the game is not more physical. It's uh, we Guys would have scored in your – no, the game's physical and scoring dropped. And, and it's a better game to watch right now, in my opinion, because they're not calling all these fouls. They're allowing them to play. And the game right now is really perfectly wrapped in play, and I love how they're doing it. So when you were coaching, you um, you noticed this immediately that they flipped the no, rules. No, I just noticed they wasn't calling fouls. And you know, the only mistake that the league didn't tell anybody uh, at first. Usually we get memos. Hey guys, we're gonna stop calling this. It was it was like they had a meeting in some dark office. Say, hey, we're just gonna start letting them play. But it didn't take long. And then Adam had to come out and say, Yeah, we're allowing it. Uh, but it was obvious. I mean, think about I I coached the game this year, Bill, against the Boston Celtics, that there were two foul shots <laughs> in the entire game. But you probably loved it. I loved it. You know what I loved? The game was over in under two hours. It oh was my unbelievable. God. It, it was amazing. So I actually like I love how the game is being played right now. It's good. Well, I like I like what you said about the dash with Jerry West, because I think Start to finish, lifetime of basketball. He's got to have that has to be the greatest career anyone had, right? He was a yeah, top the, fifteen player ever, and then was yes. a top five executive ever. He he his dash is full, completely. He lived a life that no one in NBA history has ever lived. Uh, you know, you won't look at the year that he was born. You shouldn't look at the year he died. You should look at the dash in between from college, from high school to pros. The man lived his life to the fullest. And, you know, God bless him. We're going to miss him. 